So just in the uh, general idea of utility code, if you had a string that you wanted to turn into an array, into a list, not splitting it by commas and spaces and stuff like that, you just want to turn that one string into an array, well, why would you want to do that? Say you had this string. And you wanted it into an array. Since I said it was a string, I'm going to put S there. Well, we've used list comprehension. We've seen several examples of it before. The long way would be to do something like this. You declare an empty list, right? A is equal to square, n square, and then you do something like for ch in s, meaning for every character in the s string, a dot append ch. When we're done, now a is an array containing every character. Or list comprehension. A equals, and then square braces because we're building a list, for ch, wait, 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 wait. ch for chns. I think that'll do it. Again, the list comprehension syntax is a little bit odd, but the more you use it, the more familiar it becomes. And I'm, I think I'll just call this one uh, A2 to separate it from A so that I can print them both out, right, just to make sure that we have the same things as a result of both of those. All right, and that did it. Well, my, why might you want to do that? Well, maybe you find working with arrays easier than working with strings. For one thing, you can change something in the middle of an array just by its index value. Like if I wanted to change that S into something else, like a T, I can't do this. That doesn't mean you can't change individual elements of a string. Let me quickly remind myself how to do that. Isn't that annoying? That's a horrible way of having to do it. But yes, you could write a function to change one character in the string. Here's what they're, they're uh, working on. Here's their, their way of doing it. Say I don't like that I. I want to replace that I. I'm going to build a new string. What is the position of that I? If this is zero, then that's one. So Going from 0 to 1, 0 colon 1, take that slice, and then what are we replacing an I with? An A to make it Sally. Plus an A, plus the string, going from character 2 all the way to the end, like that. So we're using slicing to replacing that character. Yeah, that ought to work. Let's print it to make sure it works. I'm going to print the new string to make sure it works. Yeah, and it replaced it. Okay. That syntax sure is gnarly compared to what it is for working with arrays. If we wanted to change that specific position inside one of these arrays, we would just do A subscript 1 equals an A. Right? So in some ways, arrays, lists, are easier to manipulate than strings. And the reason for that is strings are non-mutable, meaning that they can't be changed in the middle. And so anytime you want to make a change in the middle, you have to create a brand new string that has all the contents of the old one plus the one minor modification that you wanted to make. You can wrap this up in a functions, though. In a function, though, we could write a function called change care that would do that. Something like this. Define change care. 
and it would take a string, and it would need to take an index value, and it would need to take a new character. And then it's just going to do this business right here. New string is equal to S. Starting at the beginning, we could even leave that zero out. If you remember, if you leave the first number out, it assumes you're starting at the beginning. Going up to the index position, plus the new care, plus the rest of the string. Index plus one going all the way to the very end. So why is it index plus one? Because um, when we were trying to get this character here changed, we had to go from zero to one, and then we had to go two to the end. So we can call that function now. Now that it says Sally, if we want to change the first character to a T for like tally, Oh, wait, we didn't return it. We have to return our string before it'll do us any good. So return ns. And so now we could do, excuse, s equals change care. We're going to change that string. We want to change the first character to a t. And it did, right? So if you have something that looks kind of counterintuitive like that, if that makes perfect sense to you, great. If it doesn't, you can wrap it inside a function, and hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to follow. Change the character at position index in string s to the new character specified. That's what that function does. What if you want to change all of the L's to something else? Well, they do provide a method for that. We don't have to provide anything like that. Say we don't like um, L's anymore. S equals S dot replace, quote, lowercase L, end quote, with a P or an M. And then when we print S out, I believe it's going to say Timmy. And at this point, I believe it said Tilly because we'd replace the first character of S with that. Very useful things. The ability to manipulate your strings. This would also work with an array. This syntax would work exactly with an array, if, if, a list. If we had a list and then we called change character on it and we passed in a new list element there and specified a position, it would do it. But you don't have to do that. You can just do it as easily as that because lists are mutable. So there'd be no reason to write a function like that. Sorting a list, you can call dot sort. Get a new list out of it. Actually, you don't even get a new list out of it. You just call dot sort, and now your list is sorted. So we had a, a list called A or A2. We felt like sorting the letters in it. A two dot sort. That's what it looks like now after we've sorted it. That's weird. Why am I doubting that? Is it correct? And I'm just not eyeballing it. Yeah, it is correct. What's funny about it is that lower case, uppercase letters sort lower than lowercase letters, and then the rest of these are in alphabetical order. 
So it wound up being the same thing by pure happenstance. That was not my goal with that. We could change the string or change the array and then sort it and get a different, uh, different series of values, right? Like A2 is equal to, let's just put some numbers in there. Right, and then it'll sort it out. The fact that it looked like our original string was pure set, pure uh, circumstance based on the values that I had chosen, which were already in alphabetical order. So the methods that change the data are known as mutator methods. We can insert into the list, we can append it, we can extend it, which is where you add one list to another and you can sort the list. So I've mentioned before a tuple looks like a list, but you declare it with parentheses. And a tuple is immutable, meaning that it cannot be changed, just like a string. I wonder if this syntax, though, if slicing syntax works on a tuple. So I'm going to declare a tuple. And it's going to have somebody's name in it. It needs to be in parentheses. Fred, who is 33, and he likes ice cream. And now I'm going to try to print the first two pieces of data in that. So I'm going to print data subscript 0 colon 2 to try to get the first two pieces of data out of it. Just to see if you can access a tuple with slicing the same way you can with a list. And yes, you can. The difference is, is that we cannot change elements of a tuple the way we can a list. I cannot say data subscript 0 is equal to Bob. Bob you know, file the paperwork, change its name. That's going to be a syntax error. Nope. Tuples are immutable, just like strings. If we wanted to change the first element of that to something else, we could figure out a way. Yep. Object does not support item assignment. That is the error that you get when you try to change something inside of an immutable object. So we could do the same thing that we did up there. Nah, not going to even bother. The reason you make tuples pretty much is to create you know, something with fixed values that are not going to be changed. If they were going to be changed, you'd store them in a list. So defining our own functions allows us to work. OK, defining functions. We know how to define functions. This is what we're talking about. Define square x, and then they put this little document here, returns the square of x. The reason you do that is so that after you've defined your function, you could type help on it, and it would give you some help. If you're not going to be typing help on your own function, you don't have to put that special comment in it. Or something like this. If I go to the shell here, and I do define fun, and then the first line of it is one of those triple, triple quotes, all fun for a good time. And what does it do? It prints woohoo, fun. There we go. But help, parentheses fun, tells us. And we could put more information there, obviously, right? If it took a parameter, we would have put that inside there, right, to tell them how to call it. So you can define your function in the Python shell like I just did, but otherwise you're going to define it inside your py file. The syntax is to use a DEF keyword, the function name, some parentheses, and inside the parentheses you list all the parameters that it requires. Some functions expect no arguments. Or you can define it to take an argument but then give it a default value. For now, the number and positions of the argument should match the numbers and positions of the parameters in the definition, but that's not a must because you can provide default values and you can specify which parameter you want to fill in.
So if we're going to write a birthday party function, define party, and we take a name, and we take the kid's favorite food, and we take his age. And we print happy birthday, comma, name. We print you are percent D years old, end quote, percent sign age. And then print here is some end quote, comma, food. There, we threw them a party. But I'm going to assign some default values. You certainly don't have to do this, but we've already talked about functions, so I don't mind going ahead of where the book is. If we don't give them a name, we're just going to call them kid. If they don't ask for something special, we're going to give them cake. Now, age, I can't even think of a good default value for it. So I'm just going to say 1. I don't have a good default value for it. So now we can call that function a whole bunch of different ways. Party, we can specify that Bob likes pizza and he's 30. We can throw a party for Tim. Not fill in anything, right, else? We just throw a generic party, not give any information at all. We can throw a party for somebody, and we don't know anything else about them other than their age, so we're going to say that their age is equal to 20. Then we're going to throw a party, and we're going to say that their age is equal to 10. And their food is equal to salad. He's a strange kid. There we go. All sorts of different ways of calling that function. Because we have default values. Don't want to mess with default values? That's fine. You just define your function. You give it a list of parameter names. And then when you invoke it, you have to fill in each parameter in turn. You have to fill them all in. By giving default values, we're allowing ourselves the option of skipping some. And this one, I only passed in names, so it's going to print that the food is cake and that the age is one. If we uh, don't pass in an age, maybe we shouldn't even print out the years old at all. We could add an if statement, you know. We could make the default for this zero, right? And then we could change this so that if there is no age provided, we don't do anything. If age like this, age greater than zero, colon, print. Okay, so I just changed those two lines to customize the way that the thing works. If we specify an age, it tells them. If we don't specify an age, we don't know what the age is, and so we don't tell them anything. Guess I should make sure this works before we move on. All right. Tuple object does not, yeah, I put that error in there and then I never corrected it. Okay. Scroll back up here to where I said no tuples are immutable just like strings. Comment that out. That's our syntax error. So if you're getting that error, you definitely need to remove that line. All right, and so it worked. Bob, 30 years old, got some pizza. Tim got some cake, but we didn't specify an age, so didn't say that. Happy birthday, kid. Here's some cake. That's like the shortest possible output at all. Happy birthday, kid. You're 20 years old. Here's some cake. Happy birthday, kid. You're 10 years old. Here's some salad. So defining default values can be useful, but only if there is some reasonable default value, right? If you're trying to add two numbers together, you can't give default values to the two numbers, right? Because then what would it add together? Or if you're calculating the value of a fraction and you have a you know, denominator and a numerator, you have to have both of those in order to calculate the value of that fraction. Any syntax errors? Anybody? Uh, go show me what means. After Tim, happy birthday, Tim. Okay. Right. One or the other. It's just trying to compare two different things. 
seen equals sign, it should have been a plus. I'm sorry. Yep. So what's the point of that? The point is to make a named block of code that you can invoke, get a whole bunch of functionality just by using a single line, right? And if we had some voice synthesizer in it, we could make it say, seeing happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, and draw a picture of a, of a you know, of a birthday party or whatever. You know, this could be 10,000 lines long, and then we just simply invoke it with a single line of code. Some functions expect no arguments, so they're either defined with no parameters or you could provide some default values for them. I think we had a function with no uh, parameters when I defined that one up in the shell. It's gone now, right, because I closed the shell. That one called fun. Nothing between the parentheses, so you didn't give it any arguments. These things are called the arguments. These things are called the parameters. Arguments fill in the parameter variables. And they look like they'll be the same thing, but they're not. What do I mean by that? What if I declare a variable called name? And I set it equal to Snoke. And I'm going to throw Snoke a party. But for some reason, we've gotten the idea that as soon as somebody has a party, that they're, uh, okay, this is a stupid example. Instead, we're going to add one to their age. As soon as the party's over there, a year older. So I'm going to set an age equal to 100, and then we're going to throw a party for someone. Tim. In his age, wait, wait. In his favorite food, his pie. And we're passing age in. We're thinking that maybe age is going to get increased by one, but it's not. If I print out their age afterwards, it's still going to be 100, especially if I print out the word 100. That was dumb. All right, like that. So here's the changes I made. I thought that this guy would be able to change this variable. And so I thought that since I was passing a variable in and we're adding one to it, then it'll say 101 there, but it will not. Still says 100 because this variable gets a copy of that. Just like I hand you a photocopy of the Constitution just because you write something on it, I still have the original Constitution. That's because Python is known as pass by copy or pass by value. Most languages anymore are. However, C++ and C# -sharp also support pass by reference. Where if we passed in a variable, that variable really is there and any changes there would show up there as well. That's really what I want you to remember, the fact that I listed that there are some exceptions. It's just to kind of tuck away in your brain that whatever language you're learning, you need to make sure whether or not changes to the parameter variables will modify the values of the arguments passed in. If you think about it, that makes sense, right? Because we say 30 here, adding 1 to it there, is that magically going to somehow change that to a 31? Is that going to be equal to a 31 afterwards? Well, no. No different if you pass it in as a variable. One thing to look at about this is just because it says age is equal to zero does not mean that age is always equal to zero. That's only the default value. When we called it with Tim, we didn't know what the age was, so we said zero. When we called it with Tim, we didn't know what the food was, so we said K. But when we threw Bob his party, we did know what his food is. So that's just a default value, and I'm sure you, you understand the idea of default settings or whatever, the settings that take place if no other customizations, no other specifications are provided. The return statement. You use the return statement to get data back out of it. If there is no return statement, the special value none is returned. 
So up here we did have a return statement. Remember way back when we wrote something called change character so that we could build a new string? We had to return it. If we didn't return it, then there was no reason to build it. The birthday party is not returning anything. So if we throw somebody a party and then print out the return value, right? X equals party, and we print out X, it's just going to print none. That's a special value. Special value. In other languages, if you've taken Java or C or something like that, you've seen the word void. And the word none kind of matches the idea of void, not really. But it's just a special value. All functions in this language either have a return value specified by the return keyword or they return none, meaning no return value. It's not an error, it's just you didn't need it to return anything. Sometimes you don't care how it worked. Our birthday party, we don't, what are we going to check? That the kids had fun, you know, uh, the, the, the way it's defined, there's no need to return anything. So that's a special value that's automatically returned if there is no return statement. So a Boolean function is one that returns true or false based on whatever. Let's write a function called is int, is int. It takes a string and it calls is digit on it to make sure that there's no periods or numbers or things like that. But the only complication is that minus signs, right? Minus signs are legal for an integer as long as they're in the first place. So our function is going to be a little bit more complicated. We have to check to see if the first sign is a minus sign or not. And if it is, we're not going to cancel it, right? We're not going to say, oh, by the way, is digit, you know. So let's write a function, def is int x. Is x, well, let's make this s because we, we want it to represent a string. And let's put a comment as to what it does. Returns true if s is an integer. All digits, including a possible minus sign in front. Close our tri triple quotes. It's not a bad idea to add this comment because you ought to really kind of be commenting every function you write anyways. I mean, unless it's extraordinarily trivial and you can tell exactly by what it's named, what it's doing. Not a bad idea to document what it's doing. Okay, so let's check to see if the first character in the string is a minus sign because we have to do something special if it is. So if s subscript 0 equals equals quote hyphen, then it's special. And we are going to return, we're going to modify our string a little bit s equals s starting from position 1 going to the end. And now we're going to return s dot is digit. So all we did is we took the first character off if it's a minus sign. As a matter of fact, unindent that line. We only need that in there once. Okay. So since this guy returns a true, we can just use that as our own return value after having removed the minus sign from our string. Let's find out if it works. Print, well, number equals minus one, two, three. I am going to rewrite this a little bit so we can add some print statements for a little bit of documentation. I'm going to delete that return s is digit and that num is equal to 1, 2, 3. Instead, I want to store the return value in a variable so that we can then print it out. Retval is equal to s dot is digit, parentheses in parentheses. And now we can print the string and 
the result. Well, we should have printed the, re, um, the string before we started messing with it, right? We don't have a copy of the original string. So maybe I'm going to print the original string up here. Gosh, I hate to do what I'm about to do just to get the, uh, the default printing, the, the uh, debug printing to work. But let's go for it. Print, checking, end quote, comma, S, comma, is it an int, question mark, end quote, in parentheses. There's an easier way to do this if we use try and accept. We may wind up writing it to do that. All right, and then let's print the ret val. So we're going to get true or false out of it. If I used a try accept block to return true or false, then maybe it would have looked a little bit easier. We could have put all of our print statement in one line rather than two. All right, let's try it out. Is underscore int parentheses quote minus one, two, three. That ought to be true. Is underscore int quote a one, two, three. That ought to be false. Is underscore int zero quote zero quote. That ought to be true. And so 1, 2, 3 is an int. A, 2, 3 is not an int. 0 is an int. I think I'm not going to mess with it. it. We could take three or four minutes to mess with it further, but time is of the essence. Anybody wish some syntax errors would disappear from their screen? All righty. <laughs> Exactly right. So, write a password checker. We ask the user for their password. The password must meet some rules. Our rules are must have one uppercase letter, must have at least one lowercase letter, class letter, must have at least one digit, must have at least one punctuation symbol. Must have no spaces. Must be eight characters long. Typical rules, right? The program will loop until the user picks a valid password. And then two, I've always been curious about this. So I want somebody to write a program that'll teach me. I don't know if you've ever played the game of Risk. Has rules for determining battles based on dice. The attacker can roll one, two, or three dice. The defender can roll one or two dice. Write a program that fights an army of 20 against an army of 20. Doing each method where the defender either defends with one or two dice and whether the attacker rolls one, two, or three dice. Now, rolling one dice is a, is a recipe for losing the game, so I mean, we're not going to say that. But the rules are... Matches go to the winner, to the to the defender. So, the attacker rolling two dice rolls a six and a four. Defender rolls two dice rolls a five and a four. Well, the six beats the five, but the four doesn't beat the four because matching goes to the defender. Each loses one. Rolling three dice. Attacker rolls three dice. 
rolls a four, three, two. Defender rolls two dice. Rolls a two and a two. Then what's going to happen? Who uh, takes any hits? Defender. Defender loses two. So, fight an army of 20 versus an army of 20. Where the attacker rolls three dice every time until they uh, run out. If you only have two armies, you can only roll two dice. And the defender rolls two dice each time. Until they have less than two. In which case they can only roll one. So, the first battle is maxing out your attack and your defense. Second battle... Twenty versus twenty, where the defender only rolls one die. But the attacker rolls three. In third battle. That's really probably enough. And why do I say that? Because if you're gonna lose a maximum of two by rolling two dice, then you may as well have gone ahead and rolled three because you're still going to lose a maximum of two. So basically, we're checking to see whether the defender should only roll one die at risk of only losing one army, or roll two dice and have the risk of losing two, but with the uh, opportunity of winning more of the battles. Does that make sense? So that's a risk dice simulator. Two possible ideas. Anybody interested in either one of these? I don't even need to upload them into the project folder idea if nobody's interested, although I will. Maybe. All right, I'll put them there then. I'll put them there. All right. One of the reasons I like this one is kind of like the Pie Fighter one. It doesn't rely upon lists and strings and stuff like that and dictionaries like a lot of the other ones do. So it's kind of just straight programming rather than programming with lists and arrays and dictionaries but the rules for risk are a lot easier than the rules for pie fighter to explain. And if you don't understand the rules for risk attack, Google is your friend. Right. Okay. It could loop over and over and over to tell you a percentage or whatever. I'd like to see the results, right? Show me the results. Um, you know. Defender 1. Or, you know. Results, Defender 1. Why do I keep typing it like that? Right. Attacker has 0 units. Defender has 10. Something like that. Or Results, Attacker 1. Attacker has 10 units. Defender has 0. So that's the three versus two game. So the results of the three versus two battles is that the defender won. And the results of the two versus the three versus one results is the attacker won. Something like that. All right. I will pretty fight that. For now, I'm going to stick it in the notes, make sure that it does not get lost. Honestly, I'm expecting us to pretty much already know how to write functions at this point because we've been doing it all along well before we hit this chapter. Main. We've talked about main, but we haven't talked about it since like week two. You may already have the concept, especially if you've been reading stuff online. The idea of main is that that's where you put the body of your code rather than just slapping it in here 
unindented like this, right? But then you have to have a way to invoke main. Looks like all that needs to be embedded in a comment. And the reason you do this is so that if you import the code, you do not want it to execute the code that you're importing, right? You don't have to type this, but if I do import lecture s right there, then it's going to run all the lecture s code. But if I'd stuck the lecture s code inside of a main, then it wouldn't do all that. It would wait, and I, then I could call the functions, but it would, you know, you'd be really annoyed if you imported the math class or the turtle class or, or the OS class and it started running a whole bunch of stuff. It should instead just define some functions. So, put code inside a main function to prevent that code from triggering when the program is imported into another. Like this. We're just going to write some functions. DEF, we're going to write a function called square, which takes x and returns x squared. Do we have to do that? There's other ways of doing it, right? And define concat, which takes two strings and returns those strings concatenated. S1 and S2, and it returns S1 plus S2. Something like that. Just, just have some functions. And now we're going to call those functions. But I want to stick them in main. So define main like that. And we're going to calculate the square of 3. x is equal to square of 3. And we're going to concatenate two strings. s is equal to concat pi, in quote, comma, quote, thon, in quote. And we can print x comma s. Now this isn't the best example because it's in a file that already has a whole bunch of code. So I'm going to cut this stuff and paste it into a file called lecture t2 just for a clean example of all this stuff. So I'll bring it back as soon as I cut it. But I'm going to make a new file. Call it lecture t2. Paste it. Save as. All right. Bad news is, is now it doesn't run. Something has to call main. Well, that's easy. I'm going to add an, an unindented main. Yeah, that works. But then, if I go back to my other code and add an import lecture T2, then it's going to run that code inside main. Right? It ran the code that was inside main. I don't want it to automatically run the code. I only want it to run if I'm actually running the lecture T2 program. Right? So we're going to put this inside of an if statement, and it's going to trip some people up because you got to use double underscores everywhere I say use double underscores. So it's going to look like this. If underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals equals quote underscore underscore main underscore underscore end quote colon main parentheses in parentheses now what this means is that if we are running in the context where this py file was run then the name of this is equal to main whatever program you are running will have the con that variable set to the word main but if we import it then that variable is not set to the word main. We could prove that to ourselves by printing out name, comma, excuse me, underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, like that. And then if I go back to my other code and I run it, where I had an import statement, import t2, it's going to show me the name of the module in which I'm running it in, or not, lecture T2, sorry. It's going to show me the module name that I'm running it in. Yeah, that file was called lecture T2. But if I run it as that file, if I go back to lecture T2 and run it, 
Then the name of it was called underscore underscore main, and it invoked our main method. We should have been doing this all along just to hammer it into you. That's a professional way of doing it because it's really cheesy if you do an import of a file and it sucks in and it runs all the code that was unindented. So call main at the end of the script. You can just call main like I did without that if statement. Makes it easier, but it doesn't take that much longer to type that if underscore underscore business. And that's their example of it. Pity that whoever made our PowerPoints did not indent stuff. Right. One advantage to doing it this way is that you don't have to define your functions in order. I could go to T2. You don't have to make this change. Previously, if I had defined this stuff underneath the code that called it, that would have been a syntax error. When it got to this line, it would have said square is not defined yet. Now I'm not going to uncon. I'm now I'm not going to remove that line and untab everything to prove it. Just accept it on faith that just like you can't use a variable until it's defined, you can't use a function until it's defined. But by sticking your code in main, then all the functions get defined before anything runs. Right? That function gets defined. That function gets defined. That function gets defined. Now everything's ready to go, so that when we actually invoke main, these functions are already all you know primed and ready to go. So why do you use the main method technique? I'm going to call it function. Sorry, I called it method. One, so the code doesn't trigger execute when the file is imported into another file. Two, so the functions don't have to be declared in any particular order. It's not a bad textbook at all. teaches Python in a way better than the textbook that I'd been using in previous semesters. And it's good for people to have a textbook rather than I, when I just create my own on the, on the fly. So a dictionary organizes information by association. Sometimes they're called tables or association lists. In Java, they're called maps. And they're a key with data values. We've talked about them a couple times. I'm not feeling really inclined to go ahead and talk about that. But here's a dictionary that associates the name Savannah with her phone number and then the name Nathaniel with that phone number. And notice the use of the colons. Now, I was always showing you just adding the values to the dictionary, right? Creating an empty dictionary and then tacking on two things. But you can do it that way. I'm going to go up into main, find main now, and give that example. Kids equals, and it's a dictionary, so these are curly braces, and if you type square braces, it's not going to work. Curly braces. Tim, end quote, colon. Quote, ice cream. That's Tim's favorite food. End quote. Comma, Sue, end quote, colon. And she likes sushi. End quote. End curly brace. Again, that's a curly brace and not. So we can print out Sue's favorite food and we can print out Tim's favorite food. Print kids, quote, Sue, end quote, end curly, end uh, kids, square brace, quote, Sue, end square brace, in parentheses. I should just say subscript like I do when I'm talking about lists. Print, parentheses, kids, subscript, quote, Tim, end quote, in subscript, in parentheses. And it's going to print sushi because 
that's what Sue likes, and it's going to print ice cream because that's what Tim likes. Or because I didn't end my comment, it's going to complain to me. Go down here, add my triple comment, triple quote. All right. And so, in fact, Sue did like sushi and Tim liked ice cream. So these are key value pairs. That's the key. That's the lookup key. That's the, that's the uh, value. Tim is the key. Ice cream is the value. The value can be anything. It can be a list. We can make some test scores and assign it to Tim. And we could create some more test scores and assign it to Sue. So I'm going to create a list. And it's going to be somebody's test scores. They made a 100. They made a comma. They made a 90. They made a 95. We need an empty dictionary to add this stuff to. So I'm going to make something called scores. And to declare a dictionary, you can use the curly braces. It's not as easy to read as actually using the word D-I-C-T parentheses in parentheses. Now let's add scores, subscript quote, Tim, in subscript, comma, L. That added that list of scores to our scores dictionary. Now let's create some more scores. L2 is equal to 100, 95, 98. Maybe a little bit higher average. Not much. And now we're going to put Bob's scores in there. Scores, subscript quote, Bob. And by the way, I goof this syntax. I goof that syntax completely, so I'm going to delete this line. And I'm going to come back to the scores Tim line. I apologize for that. It's scores subscript Tim in subscript equals L. So Tim is the key. The L list is the value. Now I'm going to do the same thing for Bob or whatever. And Bob's scores are going to be L2. Scores subscript quote Bob end quote in subscript equals L2. So we want Tim's scores summed. We can do that. Print, parentheses, quote, Tim's average, end quote, comma, sum, parentheses, scores, subscript, quote, Tim, in subscript, And then two closing parentheses. We can do the same thing for Bob. And I think I'm just going to copy and paste that line. Oh, and I'm doing it again. I'm getting away with this without talking about the homework. We're going to stop right here so I can talk about the homework. But let's make sure it works. All right. And lo and behold, I didn't calculate their average. Their average. I, sh I should have done a, you know, a divide by the number of test scores. And I'm not going to do that, so I'm going to change the word average to total. Just be correct. Alrighty, I've been promising to talk about homework. Let's go back and look at what those homework assignments were that were a little confusing for some. File and directory access is the one that's giving people more trouble. So that is a uh, result of the last chapter.
let's go and look at the homework assignment. That's 14. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to ask for the dictionary. We're going to change to that dictionary. And then we're going to check to see if a file exists in the dictionary. And you can do that with using isFile. Now, I'm not going to write your program for you. And we want to know the file size. I don't give you the name of the function for using file size, so we would have to look it up. So let's write some code that does that. We're just going to stick that inside lecture T2. Yeah, it's the Pardon me? Yeah, it's the file size one. Is it in the homework assignment, though? Or is it in the it notes? In the yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to ask for the dir name. Parentheses, quote, enter a dir name. or dot for the current directory. It's just a reminder that you can use dot. We better import the OS module so that we can do this stuff. Now we're going to try to change to that directory. Now it's possible that this is just going to flat out blow up. We might want to put some of this code inside a try accept block. Well, I hope it worked because we changed that directory. It'd be interesting to run the program and find out what happens if we type a right directory, a dot. Okay, great, it changed our directory. Or if we type in something that doesn't exist, it blows up. You ought to try to accommodate that with a try except if you remember how to use try except. Well, let's ask for a file name now. File name is equal to input parentheses quote, enter a file name end quote, in parentheses. Now we need to see if that exists. So to check to see if something exists, you could use exists. In fact, we could have done that with our is, with our directory name. We could use os.isdir to make sure that what they typed is a directory. Let's throw that in. Right here, before I call os.chdir, I'm going to make sure that thing exists. So if os.isdir subscript dir name in subscript colon, I'm going to change to that directory, also I'm going to print an error message. Else colon print dir directory end quote dir name, comma, beginning quote, not found, parentheses in parentheses. All right, then I'm going to make the comment. I'm not going to bother taking the time to do it. Use is file to see if the file name exists. If it does, get the file size. The funny thing is, is that uh, I gave you all one way of doing it. The book doesn't show you any way of doing it, I do not believe. And then the next time I went, oh, yeah, get pat, get size right there. Okay. So, if it does, get the file size using os.getSize file name. All right. That ought to make that super easy. You just have to put the loop in there, expand this code, and you're pretty much good to go. Yeah, let's make sure that what we've written doesn't crash every time we run it. If I enter a dot, oh, ho, ho, OS has no attribute is dir. That's because that stuff is actually part of a, uh, of a sub class inside that library. I'm glad I didn't just trust it. It's called OS.path, right? So, 
instead of os.isdir, it's os.path.isdir. However, the changedir one is correct. And we're going to use os.path.isfile to see if the file name exists. If it does, get the file size using os.path.filename. And we might want to print out the current working dir after we change to it, right? Why not? So print, parentheses, current dir is in quote comma os dot get. I know that's not the right one. So just cw dir. So just cwd. We'll find out by going to the PowerPoint. Somebody's done this assignment. How do you uh, get the current working directory? <coughs> get CWD. All right. All right. That'll tell us the current working directory. If I type in dot, it tells me that the current working directory is 1203. If I type in backslash or forward slash, it'll go to the root directory. Right. Be nice to display a list of file names. That may be the part of the assignment that I just left off from the instructions. No? Sure would be cool to list the file names, though. You can go back to the homework, or you can check the uh, PowerPoint. I'm just going to put that as a comment. How to look at the file, the uh, directory. Doesn't show it. It's called dir list, or list dir. Let's just tack that on as a comment to our current notes, and we're going to call it a day. It would be nice before asking them for the file name to print a directory listing. Use os. Lister, not get dir, lister, path, to return a list of file and directory entries in the current working directory. All right, I'd like to see that. If you've already done the assignment, you don't have to add that. If you see anything that you think is cool in here and you want to incorporate it, that's great. You can revise it. If not, leave it with what you have, and this should help the folks who were, who were confused. All righty. The other one, the other one was 15. Appending to lists. Golly, I think by now we know how to append to lists. Yeah, I think by now we know how to append to lists. If you don't, then let's hang out after class. We can have some time after time. Uh, let's call class done. We have a Dropbox made for this folder. Going to let you all get away without any homework. I think we may wind up stopping the book at this chapter so that we can talk about JavaScript and CSS. Well, there's four things I want to cover, though, and we have like five class periods left. We can get to it all. And user interfaces and classes. Okay, so there's several things we want to do. We need to talk about classes. We need to talk about user interfaces, but I'm not going to make you all read the books about those things. All right. Go ahead and upload into the uh, Dropbox T. And on Wednesday, we should get to some fun stuff. User interfaces and classes and things like that. Yeah. There we go. Like that. 